Good evening. I'm Katie Fang in for Mehdi Hassan. 1.7 million people, more than the population of Philadelphia. That's how many people have already fled Ukraine, according to the United Nations. Its children's agency, UNICEF, adds that half of those are children. And hundreds of thousands more civilians have been displaced inside of the country after 12 days of bombing by Russia targeting Ukraine cities. European officials warn that millions more Ukrainians are at risk in the coming days. At a summit in France today, European Union foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell told reporters, quote, if the bombardments continue as they do, if the cities keep being indiscriminately bombarded, we can expect five million migrants, not migrants. We cannot call them migrants. They are exiled people, people trying to escape the war. But those escape routes are cut off by Russian attacks. In fact, a New York Times photographer was on hand outside Kyiv yesterday as a Ukrainian family of four was attempting to flee the violence on foot and was hit by a Russian mortar shell, killing the mother, her family friend, and her two young children. The Pentagon said today that nearly 100 percent of the forces Vladimir Putin mobilized for war are now in Ukraine, and Russia has fired more than 600 missiles into its southern neighbor. But Russia's military strategy, to the extent that it actually has one, seems to be encircling cities they cannot take and laying siege to them. Secretary of State Antony Blinken today leveled the ultimate insult at Vladimir Putin over that so-called strategy, saying the Russian invasion resembles that of the German Nazis who invaded Ukraine in 1941. Every Russian has lived or learned about the horrific siege of Leningrad during World War II, in which that city's civilian population was systematically starved and intentionally destroyed over nearly 900 days leading to hundreds of thousands of deaths. That siege affected millions of Russian families, including President Putin's, whose one-year-old brother was one of the many victims. Now, Russia is starving out cities like Mariupol. It's shameful. So what can the West do about it? Well, the White House said on Sunday it's working on a deal with NATO ally Poland to move some of that country's MiG fighter jets over to the Ukrainian Air Force. That's in addition to 17,000 anti-tank missiles that the United States has sent to Ukraine in an operation that's described as more complex than the Berlin airlift after World War II. But Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today pleaded that the West needs to do more and fast. You need to give us support. You need to give us planes so that we get stronger to fight. This is the assistance that needs to be given, not just to Ukraine, but to the whole world to bring victory so that humanity can win. Amid all of the violence, Russian and Ukrainian officials met for a third round of peace talks today in neighboring Belarus, but little progress was made. The Russians today offered a ceasefire to let residents flee, but only if they fled to Russia through its military ally, Belarus. That was a non-starter for Ukraine, which said its citizens would not be safe there. Both sides had agreed earlier on temporary ceasefires to get civilians out of conflict areas, but Ukraine says the Russians have repeatedly broken those agreements. They also say Putin's negotiators are insisting on keeping Crimea and most of eastern Ukraine for themselves. So with talks at an impasse, what will the Russians do next, and what will it mean for millions of Ukrainians caught in the crossfire? Joining me now is NBC News and MSNBC national security analyst Clint Watts to break down what is happening on the ground. Clint, thank you so much for being here and thanks for being in front of that map. You know, we keep hearing that the military situation is bad for Russia, but they clearly have superior numbers as compared to Ukraine. Can you tell us what is the latest and what are you actually watching for on the map? So. Katie, just starting off, this is the humanitarian situation you started off with in the segment. It's devastating. It's just growing every single day. But separately, what we're seeing is essentially uh, advances by Russia in many ways. And like you mentioned in there, not really taking ground all the time. So what is curious about all of this is a lot of the bogged down areas we, we talked about before. This is the convoy going into Kyiv still not making much ground. In fact, they've been attacked in the rear area. You see them bypassing cities like Chernaev but just trying to level them essentially with indirect fire. Same and Sumi. So what you see them trying to do is bring all of these axes of advance right here together 
and encircle the city of Kyiv. However, in each of these, they are bypassing population centers and not securing their rear area, meaning that there are constant attacks on their logistical and supply chains as they desperately try and take Kyiv. Separately, inside Kyiv, uh, today you heard about an area called Urpen, which is essentially right about here. There, again, Russian armored columns, uh, Russian uh, vehicles were taken out by, again, Ukrainian military coming through with anti-tank and anti-aircraft uh, fire, essentially stopping this army in its tracks once again, bogged down here and losing manpower because they're not acting like a real Russian armor uh, division would normally act. They're not putting infantry out. They're leaving their vehicles extremely vulnerable and they can't get resupplied because it's a log jam in there. There's reports that the Ukrainians actually blew up a bridge in the middle of the convoy, essentially severing it in two different places. Now, there's something important, though, to note, which is when you zoom back out, there is some su success for the Russians in the south. Last Thursday, we were looking at advances in Kherson. Then on Friday, Mykolaiv. And in each of these, they're trying to seize bridgeheads to go over water obstacles of the Dnieper River and other inlets. Again, over this weekend, the Ukrainians have come back. We've seen them show up in Mykolaiv and claim to retake parts of the city. In Kherson, we saw a protest. The Russians are extending so far in front of their lines trying to advance that even when you see this map turn red, they're not securing their rear area because they're in a race, I think, to get to Moldova. When they get to Moldova, there's an area right here. I'm going to come back to it in the other map called Transnistria. Let me draw this right here. This is their advance so far. If they can get here, this is a breakaway Russian, uh, ethnic Russian uh, separatist area with Russian military in it. And if they're able to do this, they'll be able to secure this entire area here, the coastline of Ukraine. And when they do that, when, they're, when they secure this, they'll be in a position to do what Vladimir Putin has always said he wanted to do, which is make this entire area here Novo Russia or New Russia, a republic that really plays back uh, centuries in the Russian history books. Putin has talked about this, and this might be what his final outcome is if he can't take all of Ukraine, which is at least create a Russian statelet that's here on the north end of the Black Sea, essentially severing uh, Ukraine from the ocean. Clint, I got to ask you, it, it seems really disorganized what we're seeing here, but is that maybe just part of some grander scheme? Are we really underestimating perhaps Putin and the Russian forces right now? I think it's more that they are just trying to use overwhelming combat power to essentially take the country. When you look at this map, this was a, uh, almost a ridiculously bold strategy from the beginning. It was really what you call three fronts and a coup. They had tried to come in from the south, from the, uh, from the uh, east, and from the north, get to Kyiv quickly, and in the first week, essentially enact a political coup, knock out Zelensky. Remember, there's some airborne forces that jumped in. Uh, they were repelled. Their mission was to essentially topple the government. It didn't happen. So now they're stuck with this situation where they've overextended on all fronts and cannot supply logistically to these troops out in front. Clint Watts, thank you so much. So for all the protests and the crackdowns we're hearing about in the streets, it's also difficult to get a clear picture of what the majority of Russians think about President Vladimir Putin's false narrative about the war, or rather the military operation, as state media continues to call it. But what about the Russian soldiers that are tasked with carrying out the assault on their neighbors? Stuck on Ukrainian roads, running out of gas and food and support from their commanders? We keep hearing that Russia's top-notch military will adjust its tactics. But can they overcome their morale problems, equipment issues, and the will of the Ukrainian people? Or are we seeing the beginnings of a deadly, long-lasting stalemate? Let's turn in-depth to the military situation. Retired Lieutenant General Russell Honoré, who served 37 years in the Army, including commanding Joint Tax Force Katrina after the hurricane hit New Orleans in 2005, he joins me now with his expertise. General, near Nearly all of the Russian forces assembled to invade Ukraine are engaged now. They've shot more than 600 missiles into the country, yet we keep on seeing pictures of broken down vehicles, convoys being ambushed and captured, Russian troops hungry and demoralized. Many are surprised by what they're being told to do and by the resistance they're facing from Ukrainians. How big of a factor is Russian morale and competency in this military campaign going forward? Well, good, mor good morale has a factor, and it's a combat multiplier. And uh, I'm glad to see they're having morale problems. 
I'm glad to see they're having supply problems. Oh, that's good. Uh, you know, you I was at Katrina for six weeks. Most of my 37 years in the Army, uh, at all levels of command, was training to fight this Russian Army. The first echelon, the division reconnaissance, the second echelon and the, of the combined arms army. Uh, we have spent in the United States in the more amount of time studying this army. We have a regiment of it at the National Training Center, a replica of the Russian army. That has been our major foe, that all our weapon system has been designed around to defeat that army. And to see that Russian army uh, go in and start practicing siege warfare is a war crime, the way they're doing this. I'm glad they're having all of these problems. It goes to show what happened when you have a dictator who has directed his soldiers, we have told, into combat as a training exercise. I'm glad to see they're having all this problem and it's being made worse by the great Ukrainian patriots and their Ukrainian army who are getting some of the missiles and supplies they need to take on this Russian army. General, are they getting enough? That's kind of the question that we're all kind of asking these days. The Ukrainian army, are they getting enough equipment, ammunition, and supplies to be able to ultimately prevail in this war with Russia? Uh, as a soldiers on the front line, you never get enough. Mm. And the other thing you don't get enough is enough time. You got to work with what you got. You got to adapt and overcome. Every one of these soldiers in eight years in fighting that Russian army down there in the Donbass region, they have learned how to adapt and overcome. Uh, when they couldn't get stingers and they couldn't get javelins, they made Molotov cocktails and they put vehicles and iron blocks out the right to roll. The Rush, the Ukrainian people and Ukrainian army have learned the first rule of warfare. You'll never have all you need. But so you have to adapt and overcome. You have to cheat. You have to deceive because you need to kill the enemy. And they are committed to that. And I'm very proud of the Ukrainian army and the citizen army that has been mobilized. The whole country is mobilized to defeat this Russian army. Hey, you mentioned a few minutes ago the war crimes that are being perpetrated right now in Ukraine. The United States announced today it's collecting evidence of possible war crimes by Russia in Ukraine, including alleged targeting of civilians, violating of ceasefires, and the use of cluster bombs and vacuum bombs. General, assuming the reports are true, what does Russia gain by using tactics that clearly violate international law like those, or does Putin just not care about what the consequences would be for his actions? I think the latter part, of you, he doesn't care. He's got an objective, and that is to destroy Ukraine. He thought he could come in and tap it and overturn the government. That didn't work uh, with his uh, first echelon troops. Uh, they, they have not been as effective as he perceived, thank God, because of the good work of the people of Ukraine fighting them. Uh, I think the next step is for him to stop and use heavy artillery, as well as his fighter jets and his long-range missiles to continue to degrade and to put siege warfare on the three cities, his three primary objectives. Uh, and the Ukrainian army are doing the best they can, but they'll never have all they need or they want. But they sure are doing a great job of what they have. And I hope NATO stand up uh, and figure out how to increase their capacity in the Kuwait. You know, NATO always worry about not breaking rules. And every day they tell you they're not going to break a rule that that that, that uh, Putin set. Hell on uh, Putin and his rules. He don't get to set the rules for the world. NATO need to stand up, figure out how to cheat and win. And what, you know what? We don't want to hear about it on television when they're sneaking jets, if they get to put them in. We don't want to hear about that. We don't want to hear about supplies arriving in Ukraine. We need to stop talking about that. We talk too much about what the uh, intentions are to support Ukraine. Everybody's trying to take credit. We need to get them what they need and keep our mouths shut. 
Well, getting them what they need is kind of going to maybe happen with some American assistance here. We've got reports that scores of American military veterans, I just tweeted out that I heard 3,000 applications from the United States have been made by veterans who are primed to travel to Ukraine to join the war as foreign fighters against Russia. You've commanded infantry troops. You've seen war firsthand. Is that a wise move for American servicemen to be able to go over to Ukraine? We got 30 seconds, General. Uh, the government would say no. But, you know, Putin lose little green men. We don't do that because we follow the rules. But Putin took three countries while three of our presidents sat on their hands. If we can create some little green men, let them go do what they want to do and help kill these Russians. Lieutenant General Russell Honoré, thank you for your insight and for being here this evening. God, Ukraine. Still ahead. 1.7 million people have already fled the fighting in Ukraine, with millions more expected to follow. What are these families, men, women, children, their pets, going through as they seek refuge? We're going to take a look after the break. A third round of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia concluded today in neighboring Belarus with little to no progress. Russia offered a ceasefire but marked corridors for evacuation that would lead to either Russia or its close ally Belarus. Ukrainian officials dismissed the offer as immoral and unacceptable and labeled the proposed evacuation paths quote, propaganda corridors, adding that evacuation routes into the arms of the country that is currently destroying yours is unacceptable. Russia has since announced another ceasefire set to begin tomorrow morning around a handful of cities. But whether that actually happens remains to be seen. Ukraine says the Russians have already broken previous ceasefire commitments. Earlier today, President Zelensky said that Russia put mines on roads that were agreed to to be used to carry food provisions and medicines for people and children in Mariupol. In spite of these failed humanitarian corridors, the United Nations estimates that 1.7 million Ukrainians have fled to neighboring countries, those that stayed face Russian bombardments that have hit residential areas. United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken said yesterday that they've seen reports of Russian abuses that would, quote, constitute a war crime. European Union officials also warned that the refugee total could reach 5 million. And as reports continue to mount about the future for Ukraine and its citizens, international pressure surrounding what to do to accommodate those fleeing the war continues to build. The French interior minister today accused the United Kingdom of a lack of humanity over its treatment of Ukrainian refugees. This comes amid reports that only 50 Ukrainians have been given visas since the conflict began. 50 people? Well, that's a far cry from Boris Johnson's original promise to be, quote, very generous. Here in the United States, the United States announced that it will grant temporary protection status to Ukrainians already in the United States. This will ensure that these people do not have to return to a war zone for the time being. There are an estimated 34,000 Ukrainians who do not currently have another kind of legal immigration status in the U.S., and that's who will benefit from this decision the most. But as the crisis continues to escalate and the number fleeing continues to mount, there are calls for Biden to do more. Let's turn now to NBC News correspondent Cal Perry. He's in Lviv, Ukraine. Cal, we've been watching and following all of your reports. What are you seeing on the ground? And, and what are people telling you about this evacuation process? So here in the, the western part of the country, we're sort of seeing not only a staging area for the eastern part of the country that is a support structure for any soldiers or any of those civil defense teams that are actually engaged in combat with the Russians, that is people sending boots, sending quilts. Um, we saw people doing mesh netting for the tents. There's, there is that effort. But this city is also really the staging area for refugees, for those 1.7 million people who have already fled, for the millions that are internally displaced who were able to actually make it away from the fighting. So many of them are ending up here. The mayor is saying today that some 200,000 have already been settled in this city of Lviv. This is a very small city, um, so it's, it's, it's almost bursting at the seams. I mean, this is a city that's starting to run out of food. This is a city that finds itself under curfew now because of uh, the sort of 
concern that the security situation could deteriorate because nobody knows how far uh, the Russians are going to go. So what we see here is the sort of terror from the east on the faces of people as they arrive here. They're packing into train stations. They're trying to make literally a run for the Polish border. Um, but it is nearly impossible to take your things and to get out of a country that is falling apart um, without completely falling apart yourself. And, and that's what we're seeing here, the emotional toll um, that has taken place already on this country. And we're only in week two of what so many people fear is going to be a, a long and, and protracted conflict um, is really profound. And again, you sort of you see it on the faces of people as they come through this city, Katie. But Cal, my question for you is, if everybody's piling into Lviv, if they're running out of space and food, um, it, does it feel like there's there's a sense of chaos now there? Does it feel like it's still organized? I mean, what type of efforts are being made to take all of those people, those mil almost 1.7 million people, and getting them out of Ukraine? So I think the effort on behalf of the government is twofold in this city. It's to keep the things trains to keep trains and buses um, moving to the border and to try to get people out because this city's not going to be able uh, to sustain it. Um, so they're trying to create order. They're trying to settle some folks here in university dormitories, in public areas, gymnasiums, places like that. Uh, but they've now run out of room. Um, so that's the organized part of it. The chaotic part of it are the things that you could not possibly account for. And that is, for example, at the train station here, anyone who had a car, drove their car to the train station, left their car, got on the train went to Poland. Um, and so suddenly this weekend, you couldn't get near the train station because there were parked cars that nobody had the keys to everywhere surrounding the train station. So the local government had to get tow trucks and get these cars out of here because all the while refugees are flowing into the train station. So it's the things that the government cannot account for because it's a sea of humanity. 1.7 million people, the fastest refugee crisis since World War II. I mean, there's not a country in the world, I think, that could handle that smoothly. And so you have a government that is overwhelmed. And we haven't even gotten to the government is, of course, trying to fight uh, the Russian army as it advances from the east. So it is, in many ways, a government overwhelmed, Katie. Cal, have you had the opportunity to speak to Ukrainians and ask, are they feeling like the international community is doing enough to accommodate the refugees there? Do they feel like there's enough of an upswell of humanity to be able to say, we're there for you? So a week ago, it was yes. The answer was yes. The international community is here for us um, in every way, sanctioning Russia and, and trying to bring Russia to its knees through economic sanctions um, and bolstering the effort here uh, in the western part of the country and bolstering troops in NATO. But as the war has gotten bloodier and as more and more people have died and as more and more people are fleeing and losing their loved ones, um, that answer is starting to shift. And it's starting to shift towards America is not doing enough to lead NATO to put a no-fly zone in. America is not doing enough uh, to create more and more of these outdoor refugee camps. And it should be said, the UNHCR, High Commission on Refugees, the United Nations, is doing a tremendous job with these camps in places like Poland, in places like Moldova. The International Red Cross is on the ground here. Uh, but it doesn't change the reality that for people who are living through a war, they're going to look to the U.S. to lead NATO, to lead that effort. Um, and as the war gets worse, there is a disappointment here that there is not a no-fly zone. The show has done a tremendous job of explaining why that is a difficult thing to even talk about. Um, but that is sort of the mood that has shifted here on the ground when you talk to people about, are you getting enough support? Cal Perry in Lviv, uh, needless to say, please stay safe um, with everybody that's there. Let's turn now to Sky News special correspondent Alex Crawford. She has this report from the Ukrainian town of Irpin on the grim reality facing the millions of Ukrainians that are fleeing from this war. They were running for their lives. <laughs> Frantically trying to keep their families together amid the mayhem and gunfire, desperately handing over their toddlers to soldiers and strangers, scrambling to get away from the firing and shelling even as they fled. Many have spent days under fire, trapped in their homes until they realized it was run or die, with the Russians getting closer. And the soldiers in my city, Russian soldiers. And Erpen, on the outskirts of the capital, is being relentlessly shelled. And there's no escape, not even for the civilians you can see at the top of your picture, running with their cases to get away. 
This is an entirely residential area. Two children and their mother were killed outright. But this area is filled with families, utterly powerless against this attacking army. The bombed bridge connecting Irpin with Kiev is now a target for the Russian troops. And those trying to escape came under fire several times. The Ukrainian soldiers tried to shoot down drones, pinpointing the positions of the fleeing families. Those rushing to get out are the most vulnerable, who felt too nervous to try to escape until now, when there was no other option. But this route, used by hundreds 24 hours earlier, is now desperately dangerous. And the attackers are showing no mercy. Well, that was the loudest we've heard. Yeah, we better go out now. Um, there's a lot of incoming now, and it's getting a lot closer. The Russian military is pushing forward towards the capital and is taking ground, killing and injuring as they do so. And a lot of the casualties are civilians, hurt by shrapnel and mortars fired in heavily populated built-up areas. Attacking civilians and non-combatants is an international war crime. And multiple families gave us first-hand accounts, many who only just survived themselves. I was helping people evacuate near the bridge, and I wanted to give some chocolate to a child, and there was a family of four there, but only the mother survived. A child, about 13 or 15, was hit by two bits of shrapnel in the head and died immediately. All three of them died. President Putin says he's not attacking civilians. What would you say to, to that? They're shelling civilians directly, she tells us. Not any military place or object. They're shooting at schools, on hospitals. They're shooting everywhere, all the time, for the last three days. It's happened. That's what they've come from. They show us the damage done to their home and the residential buildings around them and in their street. When we got out of our home, I saw five, six shells, maybe. Every building was destroyed and had been hit. The stream of people fleeing are traumatized, but many are also angry and full of despair. Putin's a war criminal, she says, the Antichrist. You've been waiting for him, now you've got him. Families have been torn apart in the chaos. They ran into Irpin from a village outside before escaping Irpin too and they've left elderly relatives behind. All, all houses are in fire and that's all that they can see. How much destruction is there that you can see in the, in the town centre? I think all, all destroyed. There is nothing to help, uh, there is nothing to build or defend. There is nothing. I came here and I left my parents to die, she tells us. And I told my husband, you've got to go back and bring them here because I can't just leave them to die. But in amongst this suffering and trauma, there are small glimpses of hope. Her 81-year-old mother and father are found. And the family is reunited. How could I live without you, she says. There is incredible heartache and fear, but also an astonishing defiance about these people. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Irpin. Coming up, international leaders are scrambling to increase pressure on Putin with more sanctions on Russia. But is the United States prepared to extend sanctions to Russian oil imports? We're back in 60 seconds. The United States and its allies have implemented a number of options outside of direct military engagement to make sure that Russia faces consequences for its invasion. The U.S. and the EU, along with a number of non-EU countries like Japan and notably Switzerland, have quickly imposed economic sanctions. These sanctions include freezing foreign assets and prohibiting transactions with Russia's central bank. The impact has definitely hit Russia hard. For example, the ruble is now worth less than a penny, dropping more than 30 percent because of Western sanctions. But Putin still shows no sign of pulling back his invasion of Ukraine. 
One obvious option still left on the table is sanctions on Russian oil and gas. According to Reuters, in 2021, exports of oil and natural gas accounted for 36 percent of the country's total budget. Any hit to that revenue would have an enormous impact on an already damaged Russian economy. Last week, the White House seemed hesitant to embrace sanctions on Russian oil imports because of the wider economic impact they might have. But now there are bipartisan calls from Congress for a ban on U.S. imports of Russian oil as Russian shelling continues to devastate residential areas in Ukraine. On Sunday, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that the White House was discussing with European allies ways to coordinate a wider ban on Russian oil imports. And earlier today on MSNBC, the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Democrat Mark Warner, said he expected a United States ban imminently. How quickly do you think we are going to see action from the Biden administration if it ultimately assesses that the U.S. does have to go it alone? Could it happen in the well, next think, 24 hours? I think it could happen in the next 24, 36 hours. The problem is that the global energy supply is already tight. Any restrictions on Russian exports would mean higher prices around the world and markets already bracing for a possible ban. Just today, as the sanctions became more likely, the price of oil briefly jumped to $130 a barrel. The average gas price in the U.S. climbed to over $4, a 14-year high. And the Dow dropped almost 800 points on Monday. So the question is then, what would it mean for the global economy to strike at the core of the Russian economy? Joining me now, Kayla Tausche, senior White House correspondent for CNBC. Kayla, it's looking like a very real possibility that the United States will implement these bans without our European allies joining in. About 40 percent of the EU's gas comes from Russia. Germany's chancellor came out today saying that the country would not be able to ban imports due to its dependence on Russian energy. Is the Biden administration prepared to move forward, but are they also worried at the same time that going alone will not have the intended effect on Russia? Well, they're in between a rock and a hard place, Katie. The Biden administration, according to my sources, is very much ready to go it alone and that they are not pressuring the European Union behind the scenes to join in that fight. They understand that at this point, despite all of their best efforts to bolster energy supply in Europe, that there's simply still too much dependence. There's a contingency plan underway to reduce Europe's reliance on Russian energy by about 80 percent by the end of this year. But they're not there yet, and they're not even close to being there yet. What's more is that it can't be done on a country by country basis in Europe. If there is going to be any blocking of Russian oil and gas within Europe, it must be done by the entirety of the 27 country block. So, for instance, France or Spain can't decide that they will block Russian oil, while Germany decides that it wants to keep one of the main pipelines bringing gas and oil into its country uh, open and still flowing. So they are in a very difficult position here. But just because the U.S. made this week announce this as a standalone effort doesn't mean that other countries won't be joining in. I'm told that the discussion is still live as to whether the United Kingdom and Japan will do something similar. And of course, there is still a discussion underway with other countries that produce a lot of oil and gas like Saudi Arabia, Venezuela and Iran about shoring up their output and getting that shipped around the world. Katie. Yeah, so Kayla, I think a lot of people need to know, though, the United States, in terms of oil imports, the most we get is actually from Canada. I think I read somewhere it was like 61 percent is actually from Canada. The next is something around Mexico um, at 10 percent. I have it here. Saudi Arabia, 6 percent. And then Russia comes in at 3 percent. So does the White House actually think that this type of ban is going to have an impact on Russia if we're only doing 3 percent imports into the United States from from Russia? Well, there is a degree of this that is symbolic, uh, that also uh, prevents any future activity, but provides sort of a chilling effect on global business activity. You've already seen companies like Shell that have decided to purchase some of that Russian oil come under uh, just real PR nightmares for doing so. You've had other companies like Valero in the U.S. say that they're not going to be doing business with Russia. There's already been this chilling effect in the market with a lot of these big multinational companies, whether they're trying to service the U.S. or otherwise, saying that they're going to be standing off. Banks are stopping the financing of transactions involving Russian oil and gas shipments of cargoes of Russian oil and gas. Some 
cargo ships are saying they won't load the cargo onto the ship because they're worried that they could get, uh, you know, three days into that journey and there could be a policy decision that comes down that blocks that uh, that activity from taking place. So I think the U.S. is suggesting that, yes, it is a very small portion of the overall uh, energy in this country, uh, but they're doing what they can to block that from coming in and hoping that there is a ripple effect uh, insofar as a lot of these companies won't be doing this other business because there might be some sort of, uh, you know, crossover transaction that would touch an American transaction uh, and, and they'll stop doing those too. You mentioned a few minutes ago, Kayla, about this idea of PR nightmares. One of the solutions to limiting the supply of Russian oil and gas in the market is to get others to put more in. There have been reports that the White House is trying a number of things, including leveraging Saudi Arabia to produce more and revisiting existing sanctions with Venezuela and Iran. Does the White House actually think that these efforts will be fruitful? Because is it worth it for us to be doing business with countries like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia, for example, that have known human rights violations? violations. Yeah, and that question was put to the White House press secretary today, Katie, in nearly exactly those terms, why the White House and why the United States is doing business with those countries with the issues that you just mentioned. The White House has uh, been very clear that they're part of very complicated, multi-pronged negotiations. But one does have to wonder if it provides undue leverage to countries like Iran, uh, who know that it, the U.S. and uh, the Western allies are in need of a new supply of oil if they know that there might be a more willing participant uh, to come back into the nuclear deal on their terms. That is something that certainly American negotiators are aware of and are wary of. Uh, so, you know, you have to wonder how these countries are viewing that. Uh, but certainly the U.S. is uh, perhaps ironically going outside its own borders to find energy, even at a time when you know, for the last decade plus, there was all this talk about America being energy independent, producing, uh, you know, scores and scores more of oil and gas here at home than had been produced before. Uh, but of course, energy is a global market. And without those global partners, you know, everyone is, is behind here. Kayla, we're going to keep on watching to see what's going to happen. So many more questions, so little time. Thank you so much for being with us, Kayla Tausche. While we continue to cover the Russian invasion in Ukraine, we cannot forget the deep-rooted connection our former American president has to this conflict. Somehow, everything can be traced back to Donald J. Trump. It has been two years since Trump faced his first impeachment trial for withholding $250 million in military aid from Ukraine, ahead of a conversation in which he repeatedly asked Ukraine's just-elected president, Volodymyr Zelensky, to investigate Joe Biden and his son, just as the 2020 presidential primaries were starting to heat up. I mean, you remember what Trump claimed was a perfect phone call, even as the House impeached him for it. But he was then acquitted by the Republican-controlled Senate in February of 2020. He proudly held up the front page of The Washington Post to prove it with, quote, Trump acquitted, printed in big, bold ink. But I'd be remiss if I failed to mention a few of Donald Trump's other enablers. There is Rudy Giuliani, Trump's personal lawyer at the time and his point man on Ukraine. I'll have Mr. Giuliani give you a call, Trump told Zelensky. There's also Mick Mulvaney, then Trump's acting White House chief of staff, who admitted to Trump's quid pro quo military aid shakedown of Ukraine. I have news for everybody. Get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. Oh, we didn't get over it. Uh, there's Mike Pompeo, Trump's secretary of state, who flew to Ukraine to meet with Zelensky during the impeachment trial. But arguably, none of those men did more to enable Trump than his attorney general, Bill Barr, whose Department of Justice not only buried the whistleblower's complaint about that allegedly perfect phone call, but Barr also tried to personally rewrite the Mueller report with his own four-page, quote, summary of the Russia probe. A federal judge called Barr's do-over of Robert Mueller's conclusions distorted and misleading. Barr says he resigned after the 2020 election because he was unwilling to back Trump's false claims of massive election fraud, but not without making a fawning resignation letter public on his way out the door. Barr went on the Today Show this morning as part of his redemption book tour for his revisionist take on his role in the Trump administration. 
Little did he know the headline from this interview would not be about his infamous book. Instead, it is this remarkable exchange with Savannah Guthrie about the 2024 presidential election. You say in your book it's time for the party to move on from Trump. Liz Cheney has said he is not fit to serve and should not be ever near the Oval Office again. Do you agree with that? Well, I certainly have made it clear I don't think he should be our nominee, and I'm going to, you know, support somebody else for the nominee. But if he is the nominee and you have your choice is Donald Trump or whoever's running on the Democratic side, would you vote for him? Uh, because I believe that the, the greatest threat to the country is the progressive agenda being pushed by the Democratic Party, it's inconceivable to me that I wouldn't vote for the Republican nominee. So even if he lied about the election and threatened democracy, as you write in your book, well, it's, well, it's better hard, than a Democrat. It's hard to project what the facts are going to turn out to be three years hence, but as of now, it's hard for me to conceive that I wouldn't vote for the Republican nominee. Joining me now is Joyce Vance. She's an MSNBC legal contributor, a former United States attorney, and a professor of the University of Alabama School of Law. Joyce, we had to talk about this today. How could we not? I need your reaction to Bill Barr's admission. He would vote for Donald Trump again in 2024. His reasoning, he believes the Democrats' progressive agenda is more threatening than another four years, four years of the former president. And this is how countries slide slowly into authoritarianism, because small, mediocre men like Bill Barr believe that they're the smartest person in, in the room, believe that they're fringe theories. And Barr was full of them. He was one of these people who believed in putting all of the constitutional powers into the presidency at the expense of the judiciary and the legislature. And he pushed that theory. And that was something that he and Trump uh, got together on early on. This is exactly how you end up with an authoritarian. The good thing about this, Katie, is now you don't need to buy Bill Barr's book because Barr <laughs> cut to the chase today. He told us that he would vote for, for a president, for a candidate for the presidency, who he knows to be a crook, someone who pushed a fake narrative of voter fraud that even Bill Barr would not go along with. He would still vote for him over a Democrat. I think that's all we need to know here. You know, but Joyce, the thing that really troubles me always about somebody like Bill Barr is he was the attorney general of the United States. He's a lawyer. So let's talk about the role of attorneys in Trump's world. They're the ones who have facilitated all of this, right? They're the ones that have lent their credibility, their licenses, right, to the former president and the conspiracy theories that he peddles. How dangerous is it? for attorneys like Bill Barr to be able to enable someone like Donald Trump? I think that you've nailed the real problem here. Trump alone is dangerous. Trump with attorneys doing his bidding is even more dangerous. And Trump with an attorney general who's fully willing to abdicate his role as the people's attorney and become the president's attorney, that's how we got as far as we did on the slide towards insurrection in this country. What Barr did, I just think, is a crushing blow to the Justice Department. You know, I was a Republican hire into the Justice Department, Katie. I was hired by a Republican U.S. attorney. He never asked me about my politics or who I was going to vote for. He just asked me to commit to pursuing the law and the facts. And that's what I tried to do and what everyone around me tried to do. That's not what Bill Barr did. Bill Barr was committed to the president. He had allegiance to the Republican Party not to the American people. And that's what's so dangerous in this setting. But how is there no consequence, though, Joyce, to somebody like Bill Barr and others who saw the wrongdoing happening in real time in the White House of the United States, did nothing to stop it, and now at the latter end of everything says, you know what, let me write a book about it. Let me do a book tour. Maybe you'll forgive me if I sit there and say, mea culpa, but I'm still going to vote for Donald Trump. We should be clear about what's happening here. This is not Bill Barr telling the truth to the American people. This is Bill Barr trying to sell books and pad his own pockets for his retirement. And, and you know, one form of accountability is denying him that, but I agree with you. It's distressing to see people like this who fail to fulfill their oath to the Constitution and who haven't faced any consequences for that. And it seems to me that someone like Bill Barr at a minimum, should face consequences from a bar association. We've seen some lawyers like Rudy Giuliani lose their licenses to practice law. 
at a bare minimum, that's the sort of conduct and inquiry that's appropriate here. Savannah also asked Bill Barr during uh, her interview about his resignation letter and all the things he didn't say. Let's take a listen. You write in this letter, this resignation letter, I am proud to have played a role in your many successes. You go on to say your record is all the more historic because you accomplished it in the face of relentless, implacable resistance. Even if you felt that way, this is somebody you told Mike Pompeo, he's dangerous. You say in your book you were worried about the peaceful transition of power. You even had national security concerns that you voice in your book. None of this is present in this resignation letter. Didn't the American people deserve to know what you knew? Well, I, you know, I think on December 14th, that's when the state certified the vote, and, in, and that's the day I tendered my resignation. I th the, re the election was over for all intents and purposes. The idea that something could be done later on January 6th was nonsense. And once the election was locked in on December 14th, I tendered my resignation, and, and uh, I knew Trump was, you know, going to be leaving office. Unbelievably convenient, in my opinion. Joyce, don't you think the Attorney General of the United States owed more to the American people to give them that information that he knew about? He did owe more, and he does make it all sound so easy with that grandfatherly look and the horn-rimmed glasses. Oh, you can trust me. Oh, if you doubt me, you're wrong, is what Bill Barr says. He's always used that very aggressive uh, aggressively, by the way, Katie. He tries to pass himself off as having been correct. He tries to pass himself off as having seen further down the road than anyone who's questioning him. And in reality, what he's doing here is just lying to the American people. And it breaks my heart to talk about an attorney general who lied to the American people. I don't do it lightly. But this letter, and I think Savannah's excellent grilling of him over this letter, really illustrates how easy Bill Barr found it throughout his career to lie, whether it was mischaracterizing the Mueller report and falsely stating that it had exonerated Trump when that was not Bob Mueller's conclusion, whether it was this letter when he lied to the American people, talked about Trump's achievements and what a wonderful president he was and how much he had achieved in the face of opposition without saying, and by the way, if you're an American citizen sitting home in, you know, Peoria or in Boston, you need to know that this president is lying to you about voter fraud. Those words never crossed Bill Barr's lips, and that's the ultimate betrayal of the American people by this former attorney general. Well, if there's one thing Bill Barr doesn't lack, it is hubris. Joyce Vance, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. When we return, Russia is also waging an information war in Ukraine, and the social media giants are on the front lines. A look at that battlefield after our break. Russians hoping to buy a new iPhone or Microsoft software may be out of luck as tech companies continue to suspend sales in the country. Apple, Microsoft and EA Games have announced that they will stop selling products in Russia because of its invasion of Ukraine. And multiple companies have stopped shipments of computer chips and other valuable components. But it's an especially complicated balancing act for social media companies and video platforms like YouTube and Netflix. For them, it's not just about pulling their business out, it's about what content to allow on their services. Facebook and Twitter have removed a number of accounts that have been spreading disinformation about the Russian invasion. They've also restricted the spread of Russian state media outlets like RT and Sputnik. Netflix has scaled back its projects in Russia and is refusing a requirement that it carry state-run broadcasters for its Russian users. When it comes to economic sanctions, though, the challenge is traditionally how to target the powerful while limiting the harm to everyone else. Social media companies are facing a similar dilemma now. As The New York Times points out, if Google, Meta, Twitter and others take some steps and not others, they might be accused of doing too little and looking half hearted. But curbing too many services and information might also cut off ordinary Russians from the digital conversations that can counteract state run propaganda. The conflict in Ukraine is also an information war, and tech companies are on the front lines whether or not they're prepared to be. Joining me now is Alex Stamos, cybersecurity expert and partner at Krebs Stamos Group. He also once served as the chief security officer for Facebook. 
Alex, thanks for being here. Let's start with that balancing act that the New York Times laid out. How good a job are tech companies doing at limiting the disinformation and the Russian state propaganda while allowing dissent to still be shared? So there's really two classes of Russian disinformation we have to look at here. So there's covert disinformation where the Russians are pretending to be different kinds of users, often Americans or Westerners in the relevant countries in Europe. And they are creating fake accounts. They are pushing the uh, Putin's propaganda view um, and trying to create the idea that there's a groundswell of support for Putin or a groundswell of support against NATO. Um, and what we've seen some gains here by the tech companies are, were announcements of two major campaigns they shut down. One was just the creation of fake accounts, the other by a group that's related to the Belarusian uh, military that was actually breaking into the accounts of influencers and using high-profile accounts to spread disinformation. And so in those cases, I think the companies are doing much better than they have in the past and are on top of it. The more complicated issue is in the overt propaganda. So those are outlets like RT and Sputnik but also the big ecosystem of people that are on their payroll to spread disinformation. Now, for years, the platforms have tracked those outlets and have created rules around labeling. Um, what they have finally done because of this is they've significantly limited the reach, at least, of Russian state media. Um, and so it took several days in the beginning to do it. There's some flailing, but I do think they've ended up in a much better place than they were just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, but Alex, even before this invasion of Ukraine by Russia, how effective were the fail-safes? I mean, it's Russia, right? So how effective were these fail-safes by these companies like Facebook, for example, in a country like Russia? So in Russia itself, it's a much more complicated situation. The vast majority of Russian propaganda is targeted at Russians. And we have to remember that. Like, the majority of the capability that Putin and the oligarchs around him have built over the last decade is targeted at convincing normal Russians to support Putin, to support his political party, to not listen to dissent from folks like Alex Navalny and such. Um, and so that capability has still been pretty effective. Now, you have to remember, you know, we, we talk about Facebook and Twitter. There's a little bit of American chauvinism here. The American platforms are not the most important in Russia and Ukraine. Probably the most important platform is Telegram. Telegram was started by a Russian who had disagreements with the Russian government, um, who had fights with some of the oligarchs financially. He lives outside of Russia now. He, he wrote a big impassioned speech today on um, how he has Ukrainian heritage. Uh, it, you know, there has been kind of mysterious ties between Telegram and the Russian government in the past. And what they're doing around Russian disinformation is actually probably much more important than what American companies are doing. But so far, Putin's hold over information internally has only grown um, until this last week. Russia had a much more open information environment than, say, the People's Republic of China, where Western social media, Western media has been blocked in China for a long period of time and still available in Russia. That is changing. And so now, through both his propaganda abilities and then cutting off dissenting voices, Putin is trying to seal the Russian populace in as much as possible and to try to stimulate as much support as possible for what has so far been a disastrous war for him. You know, the U.S. has in its government career foreign policy experts that are making decisions about things like economic sanctions and restrictions. Who's making the decisions within these tech companies about what information to allow and what information to restrict in a setting like a war? Yeah, so that's a, a really great point. And it, this comes right back down to kind of the, the biggest issue that we have over the next decade when we talk about Internet platforms, which is who has the power to make these decisions? And are they accountable to anybody, either just from a transparency perspective or preferably democratically? The problem here is that if you ask any tech company, do you follow the law in the countries where you operate? They say, yes, of course, we follow the law. And if you ask them, do you protect human rights? They say, yes, of course, we, we protect human rights. And that's the, the problem, is that you can't do both of those things all around the globe. You can't follow all of these laws. And that is especially true in Russia, where for several years now, Russia has been building up what are effectively hostage laws, where they have been trying to force companies to both keep data in, in the country, but also to have individuals in the country who are responsible for their decisions, um, so they can punish them and put them in jail if they don't like the decisions that are being made. Uh, and they've also uh, now made a bunch of different kinds of propaganda actually illegal—not uh, propaganda, I'm sorry—dissent within Russia illegal for Russians to say. So. 
from a legal perspective, Russia has been significantly cracking down and is putting a lot of pressure on the companies. Now, right now, the companies have made the choice of they're going to step on the side of NATO and Ukraine, but um, that is at the risk of their employees and the families of their employees, even if those employees are in the United States. Alex Stamos, Krebs Stamos Group, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. Mehdi will be back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. But for now, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen. And make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.